Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 119 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Margaret Pooler, Supervisory Research Geneticist with the USDA ARS, all about crepe myrtles. The plant profile is on coleus, and we share what's going on in the garden in the What's New segment, as well as some upcoming local gardening events. This episode, we're joined by Margaret Pooler. She's Supervisory Research Geneticist at the U.S. National Arboretum, and that's part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here to talk about crepe myrtles. Yeah, I can't wait. It's one of my favorite plants, and I think there's so much we are going to be able to cover in this episode, and maybe some new things on the horizon that our listeners might not even know about yet. Uh, But before we jump into that, let's talk a little bit about you and your background, Margaret. We like to ask our guests, were they born with chlorophyll in their veins and a green thumb, or did that come to you later in life? (laughs) Um, It kind of, I was sort of born with it, um, but I didn't, I didn't really know it until I went to college. So um, I grew up in North Carolina and um, I just thought it was normal for my family, for my dad to have his whole front yard turned into a vegetable garden. For me, that was just, you know, why not? So, Mm -hmm. um, so I did grow up always growing plants or being around growing plants, but it was kind of more for utilitarian. They were both from New England. So they grew, you know, it was practical. You grow your own vegetables. So, um, so I did grow up growing plants. I even had my own little garden up in the woods um, that, you know, because I, I wanted to try things my way. So without really knowing it, I was doing a lot of um, horticulture, but it wasn't called horticulture. It was just playing. Hmm. And did you go to college for a horticulture degree? No, not at all. I, In fact, like I said, I didn't really know that there was such a thing as horticultural or botany or anything like that. So I went to, um, I did my undergraduate work at the University of North Carolina, and I majored in biology. Um, and it wasn't until when I took genetics, I really liked Mendel and his pea plant experiments. I was like, wow, how lucky was he that he got to do that? That just is so cool. It combined plants, but also math and statistics and probability And I thought I was just fascinated by that work, but I still didn't really understand that there could be a whole career in plant breeding and plant genetics until later in at UNC. And I, you know, someone said, hey, you know, why don't you do plant breeding and plant genetics instead of some sort of random biology? So um, I applied to that program, plant breeding, plant genetics at University of Wisconsin. And that's where I ended up getting a Ph.D. um, in that in that area. Wow, fascinating. And so at the USDA, um, are there lots of other plant geneticists or is it a small department? In, at USDA, there are a lot of plant breeders. So because um, plant breeders are what we do is improve the you know plants that um, especially crop plants, horticultural plants, specialty crop plants. And that's everything from corn and soybeans to apples and grapes and blueberries and spinach and crepe myrtles. So there are a lot of geneticists and plant breeders in USDA. Hmm. So our tax dollars at work. Definitely. And you don't work just on crepe myrtles, although that's the topic of today. I think you also do some work on lilacs and cherries and other trees. Yeah, my probably my primary one that is sort of my first passion is flowering cherries. Um, but I also work on like you said, crepe myrtles, um, a little bit of, of stuff still in lilacs, viburnums we've worked on. Um, we have a program that's not mine, but boxwood. We've come into the whole boxwood blight um, issue head first. So um, the, our program touches in all of those. We have some work we're doing on genomics and hydrangeas. Um, yeah, pretty much a lot of the big major 
horticultural, ornamental horticultural woody plants, we have some hand in. Hmm. And so once you breed and select a plant, how does it get introduced to the public? So there are different ways. The way that we've traditionally done it is we make a selection after, you know, it's usually 10 to more like 20 years of breeding and selection and testing. And then the way we used to do it is we'd send it to cooperative um, nurseries, so wholesaler, whole growers, who would then evaluate it for us in a nursery setting to see, is this actually a plant that can make it in the market? Or, you know, maybe it looks great in our field, but it's really hard to produce or you can't, um, you know, ship, it doesn't ship well. So we have them tested in their environment. And then the ones that do especially good, we end up releasing. And in the past, we've just um, named the plant and released it to the public and to the trade and with no patents or no protection or no intellectual property. Um, but we're that that model may be changing depending on the plant. Like we just patented one of our first ones, a hemlock um, that's resistant to the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an um, interspecific hybrid. And we thought that the best way for the industry to end up taking that up and propagating it would be to license it because then growers would um, be able to have a specialty or specialized niche that they were selling from. So um, we'll see. But most of our plants so far have just been, we release them free and open to the trade for anyone to propagate and grow. Hmm. And so your office is located in Beltsville, Maryland, north of the U.S. National Arboretum, correct? Yeah, that's so my office and also all of our, all the labs for the National Arboretum are located in Beltsville. And a lot of our field space, though, is down at the National Arboretum itself. And so if people go to, are visiting the Arboretum, whenever they see plants that are planted out in rows with very few labels on them, that's all of our research plots. Hmm. And they can also go to the Arboretum and see some of the past introductions as well. Yes. So that's, um, if, especially the crepe myrtles, I, I like to tell people if they are really, you know, people wonder, well, what should I plant? What's going to, how big is it going to get? Really the best place to see the Arboretum's crepe myrtle introductions is in the conifer collection, um, which is on the east side of the Arboretum. And we have all of our introductions planted in beautiful landscape settings. These are mature trees, um, that, that you can see each tree, what its bark and, and flower color, how big it is. Um, it's, just, it's really the best way to see what these plants are going to look like after 20 or more years in the ground. Yeah, that's a great point because often you don't see a plant that is mature full height and size and can't really picture it in your landscape. Absolutely, because something that's you know three feet tall in a container at the garden center is not going to stay that big. And so you're either going to have to prune it for the rest of your life or cut it way back or just remove it and do a different plant. But we can talk about crepe myrtle pruning now or later, whenever you want. Sure. Let's get to that in a little bit. But first, I wanted to ask about what you grow in your home garden, if you do any home gardening. Mm, I do. I do um, a lot of, I spend a lot of time in my home garden. I've, I'm, I live in Howard County. I've got um, about a half an acre that's actually fenced and shaded. So it's fenced from deer. Um, it's in heavy or mostly shade. So everything I have has to be, has to like shade. Um, I, I'm not a botanist or a taxonomist or an expert of any kind. I grow just things that I like or really that sort of have personal meaning. Like I might have a peony that my mom had given me as a, a cutting, or I may have, um, I've got a pawpaw that a colleague who retired and was selling his house wanted me to come and dig and take. I've got um, a plant that I got from, you know, the phone of the Friends of the National Arboretum plant sale or that I bought at the Dawes Arboretum or something, you know, so most of my plants have some personal meaning to me or it's, you know, a cutting that someone gave me. Um, but then I also, I'm very fortunate that I have a lot of native plants um, just growing on their own in my backyard. And that's, I've been good about keeping out weeds and invasives. Um, so some of my favorites are um, bloodroot plant. Those are just beautiful. I've got a lot of native jack-in-the-pulpits 
And one of my favorites is a native orchid um, called Galeris spectabilis that's just comes up, you know, I, I don't want to say like a weed, but it almost is. It just, they just spread and come up all over my backyard. So yeah, I love, I love gardening at home. Mm. That native orchid sounds incredible. It is. It's just, I, I wasn't an, an orchid person. And so it was actually a friend of mine who's, who's an orchid expert came and said, what, what is the, you know, and I was like, oh, is this something special? And he was like, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, interesting to see what comes up when you keep out the deer and keep out the invasive plants just all this really neat stuff starts appearing awesome so let's turn the discussion to our topic of the hour crepe myrtles and first let's talk about the spelling because that can trip up a lot of people <laughs> you know i think it's really what defines the spelling is what your spell checker is going to accept and that it usually spell checker likes two words because it still sometimes doesn't like one word crepe myrtle my predecessor did it as one word because um, he said that they're not actually myrtles. So if you separate it, then it's implying that they are myrtle plants, which they're not. So he, he liked to spell them together and that's how I still do. So, um, hmm. but I think it doesn't really matter. It's because everyone knows what you're talking about. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the crepe, I've seen it with an E or an A mm -hmm. and, or I've also seen it capitalized as you said, is one word with a capital C and smushed together, or both the C and the M capitalized as two separate words. What is the USDA's preference? We do. We don't capitalize it because it's not a, a you know Latin name. So it's we just use lowercase C and all words. And I spell it with a C R A P E. But again, I'm not speak in this case. I'm not speaking as the USDA official spelling, because I'm not even sure there is one, but that's just what we, from in my research unit, that's how we spell it. Hmm. And how about the Latin name? It's a little bit of a, a mouthful. Yeah, so the Latin name, the genus name is Lagerstromia, and that was named after Magnus von Lagerstrom, um, who was, I think, a friend of Carl Linnaeus, um, I believe. Um, and then the species name for the common one is Lagerstromia indica, even though it's not actually from India, but I think at first there is an indication that it was. So, um, and then there are other, some other species too, but that's the, the primary one that sort of gives the main color and that people know is um, Lagerstromia indica. And that does bring up a good point about the that it is not from India, that they are not native to the United States because a lot of people see them so prevalently now that they assume it's a native tree. Correct, yeah. So they, they actually um, came to the US a long, like in the mid to late 1700s. And so they've been here for a long time. So, um, you know, now I think, you know, so they went from being not even in the US to, now I think there's like 3 million plants sold each year by the industry. Um, there's over 200 named varieties. So it's become just a huge, um, it's, it's, I think actually of the flowering, um, deciduous flowering trees, it's the number one selling deciduous flowering tree. So it beats out dogwood, it beats out flowering cherries, um, any other flowering deciduous tree, you know, crepe myrtle is the number one um, seller. So it went from being unknown in the U.S. to that in just, you know, over a couple hundred years. Interesting, because uh, you refer to it as a tree, as I do, but some people call it more a shrub. Yes, and that's that means that they're planting the right size for their location, because it is, it comes in, um, you know, with all the breeding we've done and other locations have done, um, you can plant a huge one that's going to be a tree, like, for example, Natchez. That's going to just be a huge 30-foot tall tree um, over time. But there are also varieties that are more multi-stem shrubs. So you're right that it is, um, we call it a tree still because that's traditionally what that species was. But with breeding, we've made it so that we can keep them pretty small or more shrub-like. 
And for those that are in the Mid-Atlantic region, we're used to seeing them in their tree form, but in other parts of the country, are they able to grow it to the full form? Um, we, in the Mid-Atlantic, we can, in the South, um, but it is, it does have some cold hardy limitations. So um, we used to say it's cold hardy to USDA hardiness zone seven. And that's still what we say it's reliably cold hardy to that. But, you know, as we've seen, even just in the time that I've been working at the Arboretum, we can now, we can grow crepe myrtles further north, even just in the Washington DC area. Um, you know, people in Howard County are now growing crepe myrtles that are not dying back that, you know, a quarter of a century ago, they would be dying back. So um, they are um, pretty much cold hardy in most locations here in the D.C. metro area. Hmm. And for those that where it's not cold hardy, it's going to die back to the ground, but be root hardy still? So some, it depends on where they live. Like I've heard in like a place like Chicago that the whole, um, that your ground is mostly frozen to, it's probably not going to, not all varieties will work. You might get lucky with a few that um, it'll die back and the roots will stay um, viable. But for some, it's just going to die back totally and the roots are going to freeze and it's, it's gone. But if you're marginally cold hardy, yeah, you can either cut it back or let it die back and you can just treat it like a perennial because that's one of the beauties of crepe myrtles it, is that they bloom on new wood, which means, so you've maybe heard of like when you prune your lilacs, you, you have to prune them at a certain time because they bloom, they form the next year's flower buds right after they flower. So if you mm -hmm. prune a lilac in you know, June, you're going to prune off next year's buds and not get any flowers. But crepe myrtles bloom on new wood. So that means it's the, the wood that comes out in the spring, that spring growth is what the new flowers are going to form on. So if you have one that dies back totally to the ground and starts sending out new um, shoots in the spring, you'll still get flower buds on that. Um, so it makes it very easy to grow, um, even if you sort of mess up with your pruning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that it's so forgiving. And I think that's one of the reasons why it is such a popular plant is because if you do a really bad pruning job, which will go into good pruning jobs soon, uh, then it is so forgiving for you. But let's talk about some of the other positive traits of crepe myrtles and why it's such a beautiful four season plant. And I want to talk first about that bark. Yeah, isn't that amazing? So it's, and just the different color. So I have had some people, it's kind of funny when I've seen um, letters and things where people say, my crate, the bark of my crate myrtle is peeling. What can I do? Oh no, I think it's sick. I think, and then other people will write in and say, no, it's supposed to do that. So um, I just think that's funny when some people think that there's something wrong with their plant and it's like, no, that's why you planted it. So, mm -hmm. um, but I love the fact that, you know, some of it, you can have like a dark, brown, cinnamon brown bark. You can have a really light tan. Um, just there's so many varieties that just the bark itself um, has so much diversity in terms of, um, you know, its color and how it, it exfoliates. Yeah, I don't, it's hard to describe it for listeners who might not have seen a, an aged crepe myrtle, but like kind of giraffe-like pattern. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, because it peels off, but it leaves, yeah, I, I would say like a giraffe, or it sort of looks like there's some other um, plants that have peeling bark that it, it just leaves a pattern where the bark is no longer there. It's a really smooth, um, just pattern of dark and light that's, yeah, really like no other. Hmm. And the shedding or exfoliating bark, is are there reasons why it might shed more often or more prolifically in one year than another? Um, it's most likely just caused by growth. So if it's growing really fast, it's going to shed that. Um, and yeah, usually like the bigger, the bigger the trunk, it's going to shed it. And then usually at least the, the full plants that we have, um, they're not going to regrow the bark after it's shed from that, that section. So it's, it grows and then it's, um, it sheds the bark and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so crepe myrtles are known for that sinewy 
kind of look if you properly prune them to the trunk and that beautiful bark. And then, of course, in summer, the very long lasting flowering timing. Um, but I have one complaint about crepe myrtles, uh, Margaret, and I don't know if breeding could help this. It's one of the last things to leaf out in springtime. So you almost want to give up on it that it might have died. <laughs> Yes. Well, and that's, you know, maybe think of that as a benefit because it's, um, that's what's going to keep it from getting hit by a late frost is that it's, it really takes its time to, to leaf out. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's so if you're trying to prune, it's, you know, you finished all your other spring pruning and you're ready to go. And that one, you don't even know if the, if the stems are still alive because they're still dormant. So I hear you on that. Um, it's, it's, to me, it's not a big issue, but especially in the spring when you're sort of getting antsy to see green, that this is not going to be the plant that's going to help you with that. Exactly. But then in trade-off to that, in the fall, crepe myrtle has some beautiful foliage color, which I think most people don't even think about. Exactly. So yeah, it's, I mean, from the midsummer all the way through the winter, it's an amazing plant. So I think a little bit, you know, we can give it some grace for leafing out late in the spring. So yeah, it's got, um, in the, so the summer, you know, you, you mentioned this, but the summer blooms, it's blooming when pretty much everything else has stopped blooming. Everything else, even the, a lot of the perennials have kind of gone dormant. They can't stand the heat and the sun and they're just, they've just had enough, but that's when the crepe myrtles are really coming into their own. So um, I think that's one thing. And then once they finish blooming, your the fall color, and, and it's different for different varieties, but um, yeah, the fall color can be spectacular. And then the leaves fall off and then you have that, nothing's left but that incredible bark. Hmm. So let's talk about, you purchase your crepe myrtle at your local nursery and bring it home. Uh, what are your planting tips and some care tips? Hmm. Um, so planting tips, um, I would try to plant it in, in it, it, we used to always say in the DC area, plant it in the spring so that it can grow and get established before the hard winter comes. But I don't know if, you know, we haven't had that many really hard winters. So really, if you can, mm -hmm. you know, get it established um, anytime, the main thing is you don't want to encourage a lot of new growth late in the fall, because that's what's going to, could get hit by cold and will not be cold, will be pretty sensitive to the cold. So you want to try to help it go dormant. Sometimes you can't, you know, we sometimes get a lot of rain in the fall and that encourages a lot of plants to just do a flush of growth. And so you can't help that, that, you know, um, it'll probably be fine. Um, but yeah, so take it home, plant it in. And the main thing is it likes full sun. So the more sun, the better. And some people think they have it in full shade or full sun, but really it's getting afternoon shade, for example. And that's, it's just not going to bloom as well. And you're also going to potentially have more issues with disease and pest problems if it's getting a lot of shade. So the more sun you can give it, the better it's going to do for you, both in terms of just its growth, but especially its flowering. Hmm. And soil should be well draining. Does it tolerate clay soils well? It can, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like most plants. Most plants like well draining soils, but it does need to stay evenly moist. I mean, you don't want to let it dry out, especially in its first few years. Um, you know, like any, pretty much any new tree that you're putting in, you want to make sure that you're watering it deeply and thoroughly um, at least a couple times a week if you're not getting a lot of rain. Hmm. And how about fertilizer? Do you recommend doing any fertilizing for it? You know, I, a lot of people, I, I think it doesn't matter a lot. Um, you want to avoid a lot of nitrogen though, um, if you're trying to get flowers. So sometimes I've heard this, I'm not sure that it, it actually is common, but people who, for example, um, they have a company or they are fertilizing their lawn with a lot of nitrogen and that gets, you know, naturally the crepe myrtles are going to get fertilized too. And so they end up not getting a lot of um, flowers because there's, it's so heavy on the nitrogen. Um, but usually the crepe myrtles are going to bloom. I mean, you'd have to put a lot on to make it not bloom. So really um, it's, they're going to bloom pretty much no matter what. Hmm. And that does make them 
one of the standout plants due to that. Yep. Because, you know, you see them along the, um, you know, like I said, I grew up in North Carolina. And so, um, you know, if I'm down there in the summer, pretty much any road, if you're driving on the interstate, you know, the exits and entrance ramps, there's like a triangle of crepe myrtles planted in those um, entryways. And you know that those are not getting fertilized, you know, several times a year by, you know, landscape people. So the fact that they are plants that were chosen to go on roadsides means that they are pretty tough and can do what they need to do without a lot of input. Yeah, I've heard that crepe myrtle are very pollution tolerant. They make great city or urban trees because they can take a lot of air pollution as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The only thing about being an urban tree, though, is that they are they are a little bit messy. So um, in terms of just, you know, the the flowers will drop and then later the seed pods can if they're heavy, they can flop over. And so if you're planting it along a sidewalk, um, they can be a little bit tricky um, to keep totally contained and behaving. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's where you just have to selectively cut something back, but I don't yeah. mind the fallen blossoms. They're, you know, very pretty on the sidewalk. Totally. I agree. Yeah. And how would you describe the, the scent of crepe myrtle blossoms? I always thought of them as like this kind of chalky, um, I don't know, dusky scent. Hmm. Yeah, I have. And it's that's where there's a lot of variation in scent of crepe myrtle because most people are not planting them because, oh, I just want the fragrance. But um, I've uh, in our field, just in our research field, and this is if people are visiting the Arboretum, I'd encourage you to just walk through the crepe myrtle research field. And you can see it because it's just row after row of crepe myrtles planted in several acres. So, um, but just go ahead and sniff a few of the flowers because they're very different. Um, some of them hardly have a smell they, or they're sort of as you described, but some of them are more, and I don't even know, it just, I just say they're more floral. They smell like as you, what you'd expect something that's, you know, a flower to smell like. So um, yeah, there's a lot of variation there and a lot of bee pollinator. They, I think people also overlook the fact that these are great attractants to pollinators. Yeah, I don't see many butterflies on my crepe myrtles, but definitely bees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're great for supporting those. And that does bring us to pruning practices. Yeah, where to start? Wow. <laughs> so it's interesting. My um, so when way back when my kids were little, and you know we'd I we'd drive down to North Carolina to visit my family. And they were so used to me having to stop the car to take pictures of badly pruned crepe myrtles because I need these for like slideshows and stuff. And so they even learned, they'd be like, look, mom, a badly pruned crepe myrtle. Do you want to take a picture? Um, <laughs> because they're just so common. But I think, you know, you nailed it when you said the reason that, that it works so is because they're so forgiving. You can cut a crepe myrtle, you know, back to just a few feet off the ground and what do you know, it'll grow back. And in a few years, you can kind of barely tell that anyone did it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of a good thing and a bad thing though, is that because they're so forgiving, people just keep doing it because there's no consequence to doing it wrong. So, um, but really, ideally a crepe myrtle shouldn't really need much pruning at all. It should just be to um, for example, to limit up a little bit. And that means if you want it to be more tree-like and there are some lower branches, you know, if you want to, for example, get your lawnmower under it or something, you can limit up so that the branches are at least above your head and not, not at, you know, lower. Um, and then just standard pruning practices like pruning crossing branches or rubbing branches. Um, you can also, as you said, you can prune off the um, seed heads too. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. If they're drooping and getting in your way, um, nothing wrong with just pruning those seed heads right off. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the seed heads are attractive, but I do know some people who that's their fall activity is just cutting off all the seed heads that they feel it helps the crepe myrtle bloom better the next year. Um, so it sounds like that's a completely unnecessary task. It is. I mean, so they're, they're right in a way in that, you know, anytime a plant produces seed, it's putting some serious energy and resources into that. 
So if you're going to cut those off, I would do it sooner. You know, as soon as you see the, um, as soon as the flowers have been, have been spent, you cut off the, the spent flowers before it even starts to produce the seed. Because if you sort of wait, it's already expended the energy to make the seed and the seed pod. And um, so you're getting the best, be the most benefit from it by doing that early. Hmm. So I'm sure you've heard of the name crepe murder. Hmm. And yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that it's going to kill the tree as we talked about, but might not be the most aesthetic look. Exactly. Yeah. So crepe murder is, and I've seen, you know, really funny articles that nursery people have written and um, it is, it is funny, but you're right. Is that it rarely kills the plant. That's the plant is just remarkable that it just keeps coming back. Um, and like I said, I've got so many pictures. They tend to be outside of fast food restaurants is where I've seen most of the really, really egregious cases of it. But even in, you know, fairly upscale neighborhoods I've, I've gone through because it's sort of a copycat crime. It's like, um, you know, your neighbor, you're saying, oh, my neighbor's pruning their crepe myrtle. I need to go prune mine. And so then the next thing you know, the whole neighborhood thinks they need to prune their crepe myrtle because that's what you do. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting sort of thing that, yeah, once one person does it, everyone thinks, oh, time to prune. Mm -hmm. I also think it's some people are trying to control it so that the flowers stay right at eye height. And or I bet some of those fast food businesses that you mentioned are trying to not have the tree grow up into the same area where the signage is. So I do see retail and other places trying to keep their crepe myrtles short just for that reason. Yep, definitely. I see. Yeah. And, and even homeowners, if they have one that was planted, you know, sometimes the builder puts in a plant and it's way too close to the house. And so after 10 years, now that crepe myrtle is rubbing against their gutters and rubbing. And so the person, the homeowner doesn't want to take it out. So they'll just cut it back um, or even cut off half of it, the half that's closest to their house so that it's not rubbing on their house, but it'll still flower and bloom. So there's lots of, you know, legitimate reasons that you need to cut back a crepe myrtle, but usually it's because that crepe myrtle, that variety probably shouldn't have been planted there in the first place. Hmm. That's a good point. Are there some crepe myrtles that you would recommend for smaller spaces? So there are, yeah. Um, and it depends on how big or how small, but um, you can go and, and there's a ton of resources online. So the National Arboretum, um, our website, has a crepe myrtle comparison, but even other, um, other like uh, Texas A&M, um, there's a lot of different universities that have great crepe myrtle comparison um, things, or even nurseries, a lot of nurseries will have it, have comparisons um, of ultimate size and, you know, width and spread and height. So I would def definitely just do some homework before, because you can get them from everywhere from, you know, five feet high to 30 feet high. Mm -hmm. And yeah, some of the new breeding work that I'm seeing is for container sized or more shrub like crepe myrtles. Yeah. And that's the thing. So a lot of them will do, you can grow it in a container, um, especially if you're in a really cold location, you can grow it in a container and then just once it goes dormant, drag that container into your garage or just any place that's, you know, marginally above freezing, or even it could get a little below freezing, but keep it dormant in your garage for the winter and then just bring it back out in the spring and you can just treat it as a large container plant. Hmm. So let's talk about some of the breeding work that you've done and some of the other breeding work going on in the industry. Uh, what traits are you specifically looking for? So we, the Arboretum started out, um, our, our biggest claim to fame was um, powdery mildew resistance. And this um, I'll just, I'll give you a little background on sort of the history of breeding, just because to me, it's just so interesting. And so, so sort of how opportunities come and can just revolutionize a whole, a plant. So, um, before, um, you know, we talked about Lagerstromia indica, that species. Um, so that's what was brought to the U S back in the, you know, late 19 or late 1700s. And that's what was grown throughout the Southern um, southeastern U.S. for a long time. 
Um, but it had an issue in that it was very, very susceptible to powdery mildew. So powdery mildew wouldn't kill it, but it just, it gets, it hits the leaves, the flowers, the flower buds. It just, it's, you know, really unsightly. So my predecessor, um, Don Egoff, who was the breeder before I came, um, he recognized that that's an issue. And so he started breeding for resistance. And at the time when he started, he didn't have any other species other than Lagerstromia indica. So he made some selections just among that, within that species and made a, some strides towards a little bit of increased tolerance, but nothing was really resistant to powdery mildew. So um, then just we got really lucky in that a plant collecting trip to Japan came back with a new species, and that was Lagerstromia forii, um, which the flowers were nothing great. They, were, um, they weren't this different, you know, rainbow shades of colors. They were all just white, and it was a short time span of flowering. But Lagerstromia forii had amazing um, bark, and it had almost total resistance to powdery mildew. So um, we got some of those at the Arboretum. They were collected in the 1950s. Um, we got some at the Arboretum in, I think, the late 1950s. Um, Don Egoff, being a plant breeder, noticed, he was like, wow, these are, this new species is totally clean. The, the leaves are, there's no powdery mildew. So he kind of went, aha, this might be that source of resistance that I've been looking for. And so fortunately, um, he made some crosses between the two species. And fortunately, the crosses were totally compatible. That is, they, they resulted in fertile seeds that could then be used um, in subsequent generations, which that's not so common. A lot of times when you cross two different species, either they don't cross at all um, or they'll cross, but you won't get fertile progeny from them. And so you're sort of at a breeding dead end. Mm. Fortunately with this, they were close enough that you could make compatible crosses and you'd get seeds from it. So um, that was kind of the thing that revolutionized really the, um, for a long time, what people planted for crepe myrtles, because he made that cross, made selections, and then the first interspecific hybrid that he released, that was in 1978, was Natchez and Muscogee. And Natchez is still, I think, one of the top sellers in the industry. It's the big, you know, tall white one. So, so he kind of started the whole um, powdery mildew resistance. And at the time, that was pretty much the major issue that crepe myrtles had. Yeah, they had cold hardiness issues, but in terms of diseases and pests, that was the big one. Um, since then, some other pests like, you know, crepe myrtle bark scale is a big one. Um, aphids, there's Cercospora leaf spot, um, and then still powdery mildew. So there are some other um, diseases and pests that we're looking at, but actually other programs in the U.S. Um, at different universities are also making a lot of headway on these, mostly because they have much better natural pressure to these diseases than we do. Like, for example, crepe myrtle bark scale, we didn't have at the U.S. at the Arboretum for a long time, and so we couldn't really look at resistance or tolerance to that. So, so that's, those are the disease problems, mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're looking specifically now, we sort of narrowed our program because there's so many, I think, like I mentioned, there's at least like 200 named crepe myrtle cultivars out there. So we don't want to just keep adding more and more that, that don't have a specific purpose. So we're looking specifically at um, unique flower color, um, mostly reds and really deep purple is what we're, we're looking for but also um, form. So we're looking, we're focusing on the miniature kinds, but also we have some upright ones that are naturally very strongly um, upright types that um, could do better in like smaller landscape settings. Hmm. And I've also seen from breeders a darker foliage on the crepe myrtle, so almost like a purple black. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that's a, that's a really interesting one, especially when you contrast that with um, either like white flowers or light pink or something, it really stands out the contrast of the foliage and the flowers. Those are just spectacular. Yeah. We don't have a lot of those, the genetics for that in our collection. Um, but yeah, those are, those are great ones. And if you can combine those with the powdery mildew and some of the other 
um, resistances and, and other traits, those are just going to be, yeah, standout plants. Yeah, I think with the dramatic coloring of the dark leaves and some of the bright, bright purple or red flowers that you're talking about, they're just phenomenal plants. But mm -hmm. I do worry, though, that they're not as re disease resistant or that they're not as um, versatile in the landscape. Yeah, and that's uh, it's it's tough to say, because especially if and, and I'm, I'm not at all bad mouthing the industry, but they can't like USDA can wait 20 years to release something because we can test it in multiple locations and we can take the time. But if you're a company that's breeding something, you can't just sit on a plant for 20 years. You need to, you know, get it moving and release it. So sometimes they may not have had this really thorough testing that that maybe they should have had. But honestly, the market is going to sort that out. And then the next round that comes through will be better. So um, I don't think it's really a long-term problem. It might just be the first generation mm -hmm. of these newer ones might not be always as good, but they'll they'll be bred. That those traits will be bred into it as time over time. Definitely. So you were referring to some of the um, disease issues and insect issues of crepe myrtles, and I've been hearing from a bunch of readers and listeners in the D.C. area of an increase in the crepe myrtle scale and sooty mold resulting from that. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, that's a tough one because um, control and also just crepe myrtle aphids are also can sometimes be an issue that can um, release their honeydew and, and whatnot. So um, we, I would say, um, I've heard that neem oil can be effective, but not so much on the crepe myrtle bark scale because it doesn't get down into them, especially when they're dormant. So um, I would ask, you know, I'm not a pathologist or an entomologist, so I would go to your local extension agent for probably for the best advice on that. Hmm. Yeah, what I'm hearing reports are of it's either the aphid or the scale causing the honeydew to drop down and make the garden sticky below and making sooty molds. Um, hmm. Yeah, so a spe with aphids, I think there's a little bit more hope in that those are, and they're not always easy to control, but um, just having beneficial or natural predators of the aphids can really help with that. And so, um, you know, things like, you know, people have heard of ladybugs or one that everyone, but lace wings um, and just making sure that the environment that you're in supports these natural predators um, and sort of is in balance. Because sometimes when one insect species starts to take over, it means there's something that's not quite in balance. So something, the predator isn't there and maybe because something is, is killing the predator. So um, sometimes, especially with aphids, you can do some control just by really trying to make sure that you're supporting a kind of environment that's going to support the natural predators. Hmm. And if they have a really bad infestation, would you recommend just cutting the entire crepe myrtle back and removing the infected limbs? Um, for bark scale, you could. Yeah, that's because I think that's going to be that's a little bit harder to control than an aphid infestation. Um, and that, but that may mean, you know, cutting it back really hard, which mm -hmm. especially if you have an a old plant, that's not always, you know, the best thing to do. But fortunately, a lot of times they are more in some of the smaller sort of um, where the, the um, stems come together. So sometimes you can just do, it might be a major cut, but it's not going to cut it all the way back. So I'd say that's probably a good first step. Great. Well, I wish those listeners who have those issues success, because it sounds like maybe this year was particularly harsh for those conditions in D.C. just because it was such a, a wet and humid summer. Mm -hmm. But it's probably not going to get better. I mean, the good thing is, is there are um, researchers, I think the program at Texas A&M is doing a lot of solid work on crape myrtle bark scale. So there, you know, help is on the way, but um, we just don't have it there yet. Hmm. 
So other things that you're looking for in the breeding program, you were talking about size and maybe some the dwarf ones. Um, are you looking specifically for small space gardening or um, for residential or commercial use? Yeah, we were mostly, um, especially with the upright ones, we're thinking more of um, be, so being able to grow a crepe myrtle in a smaller space garden, you know, a lot of home gardens, um, even if they're, even if you have a single family home, um, there's just, there's not a lot of room to put a huge Natchez crepe myrtle. I mean, that's going to be the tree in the yard. And so um, if we can get something that stays a little more upright, it's going to allow um, you to, to put the crepe myrtle there and it's not going to take over everything. Um, or it could be something that you could put at sort of the corner of the house, sort of anchoring it. And again, it would fit there without rising up and overtaking the roof and the gutters and all that. So um, we are, we're looking at homeowner, but also, like you said, commercial landscapes where, again, there's just not a huge open space to plant these huge trees. Um, so we're looking at, you know, seeing if we can broaden the places that you can plant crepe myrtles and they'll, it'll be the right site for them. Hmm. And one thing I didn't talk about in the beginning that I think listeners would be interested in, which is propagation. Are the, all of these done with tissue culture or how are you making the crosses and propagating them? So the, um, and that's actually another reason that crepe myrtles are so popular is that they're so easy to produce. So for growers, um, you know, commercial growers, you can propagate them from cuttings. Um, you can take a softwood cutting right early in the spring. You can take hardwood cuttings in the fall. You can take what are called um, root cuttings. You can take um, dormant wood cuttings that you just kind of put in dirt and they'll, they'll send up shoots. So um, they're very easy to propagate, um, at least most varieties are, um, and to get a saleable plant within you know a year or two after propagation. So um, they're very, they're a good plant in production. And even a homeowner can do that. You know, I think most homeowners would have success if, you know, you just dip it in a rooting hormone. And even that is a lot of times optional for crepe myrtles. But um, so you can, I think just hobbyist propagators can, would have a pretty high success rate propagating most varieties of crepe myrtle. Yeah. Hmm. And I have seen some reseed about? Do the seedlings come true to the parent? The seedlings do not come true because they're, um, it's just like, um, just like if you have a kid, your kid is not identical to the parent. So, because what's happened is there's been recombination. Um, these are, they're, um, it's not a clone that's coming up. It's, it's an actual seedling. So they're going to be a combination of the female, the seed parent, and then whatever the pollinator was. So they might, some might look similar, but um, they're not going to, they certainly won't be genetically identical and they won't be even, um, they won't look exactly identical. Hmm. So, but yeah, you're right. And the seedlings generally, we do see a lot of, especially in, at the Arboretum, they definitely will go to seed. So, but, um, so I guess you could say they could be weedy in a summer or in a sunny location, but we haven't seen any indication yet of them being invasive by the, the formal definition. That is having the ability to invade um, undisturbed areas and, and take over and change the um, ecosystem there. We haven't seen that yet with them. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they will set seed. Yeah, I've only seen seedlings usually right within the canopy of the tree and just yeah. a little bit. So, and pretty easy to pluck out and find. Definitely. Yep. So how can our listeners contact you or get more information about crepe myrtles and the U.S. National Arboretum? So um, you can go to the um, National Arboretum's website um, and you can just Google U.S. National Arboretum and, and it'll pop up. Um, I'm listed on there as one of the scientists. In, if you go to the research section and go down to scientists, um, you can contact me that way. Or I think there's a um, space on the website that you can just do a general comment. And if you if it's about a question about crepe myrtles, they'll send that to me anyway. So either way is fine. Um, I would, like I said earlier on, the best way if you're really trying to look at different crepe myrtles is to visit 
the Gatelli conifer collection at the Arboretum to just see these plants in full bloom, um, in full landscape situation um, at, you know, and each of those is probably 10 to 20 at least years old. So you get to really see what they're going to look like if you planted them in your location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and best to do so in July, August, uh, maybe a little bit into September as well. Yes, yeah. They're still in bloom now, but at least a lot of the ones that I saw. Some have already gone pretty much to seed, but there's still a lot in bloom. So if people are looking for just a nice way to spend an afternoon or a morning, um, even this weekend, there's they can still see a lot of crepe myrtles. Great. Uh, any final thoughts on crepe myrtles or plant genetics? Um, no. So thank you so much, Margaret, for sharing uh, your passion for crepe myrtles and all the great breeding that's being done at the Arboretum and USDA. Really, it's my pleasure to talk to you and to I hope that some of this help was helpful and useful to the listeners. Thanks for having me. Coleus plant profile. Coleus solenostomum scutelloides is a colorful annual plant that adds interest and texture to the garden. Coleus is often compared to stained glass art or decorative rugs. There are several hundred coleus cultivars in many different foliage shades and variegations to add punch to a shady spot or a mixed container. Some newer introductions are even quite sun tolerant. Coleus prefers consistent moisture and being planted in soil that is well draining. It needs only occasional light fertilizer. Avoid placing it in windy locations or hot afternoon summer sun. If your coleus is bothered by slugs or snails, sprinkle diatomaceous earth around the base of the plant. It thrives in temperatures between 60 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. When nighttime temps start to drop below 55 degrees, you can take cuttings from your plant and root them in water. Then pot them up and overwinter them indoors as a house plant. Whether to allow coleus to set flower or not is up to you. Letting it flower does take energy away from the plant, so we recommend pinching the emerging flowers back every few weeks to encourage the coleus to grow more dense foliage and in a more compact form. Coleus, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, I was late planting the cucamelon and the dahlias and both are starting to bear fruit and bear flowers. So I'm glad to finally see that and maybe I'll have them for a few more weeks and then we'll expect a frost maybe at the end of October. We'll see. In the local gardening world, we have our family fall festival and plant sale at Green Spring Gardens coming up on Saturday, September 17th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. I'll have a booth there and be signing and selling our book, The Urban Garden, as well as signing up subscribers for Washington Gardener Magazine. Come by and say hi. We might even have some pawpaws for tasting if we have enough fruit in to be able to share those. That same day in the evening at 6.30 p.m. Saturday, September 17th, the American Horticultural Society is turning 100 and they are having their 100th anniversary gala at River Farm in Alexandria, Virginia. Also celebrating an anniversary this week is Smithsonian Gardens, which is turning 50 years old. Uh, Happy anniversary, Smithsonian Gardens. Um, Looking ahead, Saturday, September 24th from 1 to 4 p.m., the Northern Virginia chapter of the Azalea Society of America is having its uncommon evergreen and deciduous azaleas plant sale. That's at the Kirkwood Presbyterian Church in Springfield, Virginia. You can find out more about that at nv-asa.org backslash sale. 
Another sale coming up that you'll want to add to your calendar is Saturday, October 1st from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the U.S. National Arboretum. Their fall festival and bulb sale includes unique bulbs and family activities. You can find out more about that at fona.org. And I have an upcoming webinar through Brookside Gardens on Thursday, October 20th in the evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Getting your garden ready for winter. We're going to go over the long to-do list of garden tasks and what you don't need to do as well as what you do need to do to batten down the hatches for the upcoming winter season. And that you can register through forum uh, activemontgomery.org. And there is a fee of $12. Friends of Brookside members um, are $10. And I have been visiting several public gardens over the last couple of weeks because the weather has cooled off a little bit and everything is looking full and beautiful. I especially recommend that you visit Meadowlark Gardens and Brookside Gardens. The tropicals are looking incredible these days. So if you're in the Washington DC area and able to get out to some of those public gardens, uh, take some time in the next few weeks to do so before the frost hits those tropicals. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spate, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.